So hello and welcome to my presentation on multifractal analysis for financial time series. I'm Millie Tobin and this work has been supervised by Dr. Stephen Lynch. The contents of this talk mainly regard the analysis conducted by myself as a part of my final year dissertation project and concluding sentiments should hopefully summarize the work that's been entailed and suggest ways of moving forwards. <clears throat> So the aim of this project was to research thoroughly multifractal theory and its uses and potential uses within finance. Main objectives were to use MATLAB to obtain all multifractal spectra and then the subsequent use of such spectra for industry-based research, such as for the characterization of bacteria on surfaces and to divulge market behavior from financial time series data. So fractal theory regards certain geometric objects which exist outside of the Euclidean geometry that being the geometry of lines, spheres, and planes. <clears throat> and according to, as we call him, the father of fractals, Benoit Mandelbrot, this fractal geometry can also elucidate movements and patterns in the financial markets. So what is a fractal? A strict fractal object has non-integer dimension and is identical at different scales or it's scale invariant. So it's basically an image repeated at different levels of iteration. We can see that here in the, um, the Koch snowflake, one of the more well-known examples of a fractal. <clears throat> so what's different about a multifractal? Well, multifractal theory stems from fractals in real world systems where the idea of scale invariance doesn't quite hold. In reality, objects have different densities on different scales. And as a result, we need a continuous spectrum of densities. So the spectrum of densities finds proper representation in what we call the F-alpha curve. The F-alpha curve tells us about the density, dispersion, and clustering present in the object or data in question. And this has uses in both image and data analysis. For example, earlier this year, I contributed to a journal paper on the retention of cockle bacteria to surfaces with some microbiologists from MMU uh, using multifactor analysis we could quantify how well dispersed different bacteria were across different surfaces tested, as well as how they clustered together in groups. Uh, I think I've referenced the paper at the end. Um, so this particular F alpha curve is left skewed, and we can see that it's got a delta F greater than zero, which means that um, we have a presence of clusters of gaps in the object or dark pixels, as we can see in the image. And we can see we've got a wide delta alpha as shown. Um, which means that the pixels are well dispersed. So this is what a homogeneous or a symmetric F alpha curve and a pixelated image looks like. So we've got an F alpha approximately equal to zero and a relatively small delta alpha. Uh, we could see that if we were to zoom into one particular section of the image, it would be basically the same as the whole image. Uh, so now we've got a right skewed F alpha curve and we can see we've got a delta F less than zero. Um, a negative delta F in binarized images means that we've got a clustering of bright pixels or in, a, in data, it just means we've got clustering in general. So the density of all these images is two because the images are of course in the two dimensional plane. Um, but if we look at this dotted line here, where it crosses the um, F alpha curve, that is at a point called Q1 or it's the information dimension, sorry. That's called the information dimension. And basically it tells us about how the morphology of the object changes. So in this section, I'll discuss the uh, results of the rolling window multifractal analysis that I've performed upon two European indices. And um, here we can see the formation of F alpha curves as time progresses. So the research paper from which this section finds its foundation is called dynamical variety of shapes in, in financial multifractality. The results of which are shown here <clears throat> uh, with a rolling window multifractal analysis or a timeline of F alpha curves uh, for the NASDAQ over 50 years and also a bird's eye view of the same graph or what we can call the values of alpha against time. <clears throat> so here, there, here are the results of my rolling window multifractal analysis of the FTSE 100 and the Deutsche Aktien index. In each case, multifractal spectra have been formed as a consequence to around 180 14 year long windows, each consisting of 3,540 data points and graduated monthly through the 28 year period. <clears throat> and I've taken a month as 20 trading days. Uh, so much data that it almost destroyed my laptop. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so that you can see the timeline begins in 1993 and that's on the 23rd of March and it ends on the 23rd of March, 2021. And now during, <coughs> sorry, during this time, we've had quite a lot of major economic events occur. So uh, just to note, we've got the 1997 Asian financial crash, the 2000 dot-com bubble burst, the 2008 financial crisis, the Eurozone debt crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic induced crash. So here are some alternative views of the rolling window F alpha curves for both indices. And we can see that significant changes have occurred, especially in the right side of the F alpha curves for the German index onward from around 2014. So the increase in width in the alpha direction shown correlates with the two crashes of 97 and 2020. And now current literature relates this measure of dispersion to increased volatility in a time series. So here we've got a plot of alpha against time, or again, that bird's eye view of the previous F alpha curves. And this is for the FTSE 100. Economic events that have occurred throughout the period are shown to help age your visualization. Uh, I've got to say that the Eurozone debt crisis, I couldn't really include because I couldn't assign it to one particular date. Um, and here's the same graph, but for the Deutsche Aktien index. So <clears throat> to better understand the changes in asymmetry that we can see, I've plotted delta F values here against time. The red circles indicate large increases in left-sided asymmetry, and the blue circles show significant decreases in left-sided asymmetry, or a closeness to symmetry or right skewing in F alpha curves. In both cases, the red circles or a shift to left-sided asymmetry align with the Asian financial crash and the 2020 COVID, COVID crash, sorry. So the FTSE 100 approaches symmetry or zero in about 2012, and the DAX actually reaches negative F alpha values or right-sided asymmetry in around 2014. So current literature relates left-sided asymmetry to single large fluctuations contributing to multifractality and right-sided asymmetry to smaller localized fluctuations causing multifractality in a series. So what we can see here is a comparison of delta F and delta alpha values over the time period. We've got to recall here that delta F is relevant to clustering behavior and delta alpha is dispersion proportionate to volatility. So as highlighted by the green circles, um, we can see a very similar seemingly major event occurs in both series. So in 2012 for the FTSE and 2014 for the DAX, where delta alpha increases and delta F decreases like hugely. So this is important because it means that at these moments, volatility is spiked up. And, but at the same time, so is the tendency for smaller fluctuations, smaller localized fluctuations or lots of small events causing multifractality instead of like here where we've got these large singular events or one-off major events causing the multifractality, such as, you know, crashes. So to conclude, basically, we've got the confirmation that multifractal spectra do indeed have the capacity to elucidate major economic events uh, within financial time series data. And there's reason as well to hypothesize that left-sided asymmetry in F alpha curves could be an indicator to specifically to any number of qualitative symptoms of market failure, such as inefficiency, liquidity, bubbling. So it's clear from the results that stock market crashes particularly are heralded by left-sided asymmetry. And um, the continuation of left skew into the present day shows us that we're still in the midst of a crash or at least in the fallout from one. So I'm suggesting also that the lenience of spectra uh, to homogeneity and a small alpha width is a symptom of stability in a market and therefore liquidity. So a period of liquidity in a market. Um, and finally, as we could see in the last slide, there was certainly a moment in the FTSE and the DAX where volatility increased and small fluctuations increased at the same time. And what this actually means in terms of the economy, I'm still investigating. Um, at the moment, I'm completing a journal paper summarizing these findings, and it'll be co-authored by my supervisors, Dr. Stephen Lynch and Dr. John Morrison. Uh, it's due for submission later this year. So as, as public financial market data is very limited, um, the potential for real actionable macroeconomic insight from results such as these is limited as well. So I hope that I can continue with this research 
uh, with more and better quality and longer data when I under I undertake postgraduate study at Alliance Manchester Business School. Uh, Alliance Manchester Business School, uh, I'm where I'm going to be studying for a master's in quantitative finance. So thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. You can see the references that I've mentioned throughout are on screen and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have now. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I was a bit surprised to see that you used MATLAB. I like MATLAB quite a lot, but I know I, that uh, I like your, MATLAB, one but... of your supervisors is a proponent of Python. So uh, Stephen yeah, Lynch, yeah. right? So yeah. uh, it was a bit surprising and interesting. Yeah. So MATLAB very nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, MATLAB is great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so Erin has two questions, not okay. one, two. Okay, Erin, I think you can unmute. Oh, yeah. Um, so, first of all, I'm just wondering, could you explain this alpha a little bit more? Is it, uh, is it the point such that a linear equation goes through the origin and meets the, like, an extremum? Like, like a meets is a tangent to the line as well let me um let me share my screen again sorry is, is alpha the gradient of this line or, yeah right. it's, it's, it, yeah i'd like a little bit more like, uh, i will um explain oh hang on let me just go back on here so so if we just pause it on there so um oh right <laughs> so Right, alpha in that direction. So I call it, I prefer to call this curve, the F alpha curve. Some people call it the DH curve. So alpha would be H. Alpha is like, it's an exponent. Yeah, it's called the Hurst exponent. Some people call it the Holder exponent. And it basically relates to the power law. Uh, so it relates to the fractality of the object in question. So where we would describe um, the, where we would describe the fractality of something in terms of its uh, dimension. And obviously there's a power law relation in all fractals. That basically is the measure of it. So alpha is also known as H and H is the Hurst exponent. So that's the particular exponent which defines it as a fractal, if you get what I mean. And then F alpha would be the dimension. So that's why it's also called DH for D for dimension. Okay. If Layers things up a little bit, so yeah, it's directly related to the the power law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the um, uh, my second question would be: Have you have you? It's a different kind of perspective on finance, financial mathematics. But have you thought about how this ties into Black Scholes? So so how how this would? Yes. Uh, yeah. So I. I mean, obviously, for me, dissertation is obviously much longer than the PowerPoint I've just shown. But um, yeah, so I did a little look at Black Scholes. Am I still showing my screen, by the way? No. I did look at Black Scholes a little bit. And yeah, and there's a lot of literature where people have obviously considered that Black Scholes isn't very efficient and it's not very correct. People are using fractional Black, black Scholes. So they're using this parallel relation and fractals. There's, there is, there's actually a whole methodology for fractional black shoals, I'm pretty sure. So I wouldn't really need to, I mean, I did look into it just out of interest, but I haven't really gone into it in terms of my research, but um, yeah, there's basically a whole, there's a lot of people using the fractal version of black shoals, which is interesting and it's definitely necessary. I mean, um, obviously you probably know ben, who Benoit Mandelbrot is. Um, if you read his book, he is like, screaming for people to get rid of black shoals immediately and obviously fractional black shoals is a step towards more accurate you know option pricing and stuff but um people are saying it's still not enough i mean it's like there's there's mathematicians in this area asking for people to someone to completely rewrite that completely rewrite that equation so but, really, can, can i interject there so um so I teach financial mathematics here. So by the way, um, uh, one, I guess, okay. So in the, in the standard black souls model, yeah. uh, you're using constant volatility. So mm -hmm. yeah. perhaps what you are suggesting is not only you want to use volatility, which depends maybe on time, perhaps uh -huh. yeah, also yeah. on 
on the underlying assets price, but you yeah. want to make this a stochastic process, like volatility. Well, to be a no, not, process as well, like not a stochastic whole. process because I mean, I mean, when we say stochastic, we mean like ran, a randomly distributed. Mm -hmm. We mean a random process. Whereas my well, and this whole philosophy of fractals is that the markets don't follow random processes. It's mm -hmm. not random. It's deterministic. So that's where the idea of fractals kind of comes in. But um, so it would be that the volatility follows a, a fractal structure. Right. Uh, I mean, um, OK, so for example, what you use as a model for the asset pricing is the geometric mm -hmm. Baronian motion, right? Yes. Yeah. It's just a model, right? So basically what you're saying is this is what I observe in the market. Mm -hmm. And this is a process that looks like it's achieving like the sort of mm -hmm. uh, landscape that I see. And then yeah. I try to fiddle with the stochastic model to try yes. to represent what Make I actually see in the, in the data, right? Realistic, so, I mean, yeah. If, you, if you're trying to use some model, then again, you're trying to, you know, all models are wrong, right? But some oh, yes, are absolutely. Yeah. So, so my my view is just that the, the multifractal model is somewhat a little bit closer okay. to the reality than, say, Brownian motion. I mean, I, I think I did a bit of a talk on Brownian motion in my uh, yeah. the markets in my dissertation. But yeah, I just think that, you know, markets couldn't possibly be random. They couldn't. It just I just, just don't think it's possible. And I think those outliers that we see, I mean, my analysis is basically a those outliers are so important. So to ignore them and to pretend that it's random and it's just, it's just not realistic. I mean, okay. yeah, so.